To talk about thermodynamics, as in any subject, some concepts and definitions are needed. That way one can discuss what is known. Firstly, the scales at which thermodynamics is applicable. A microscopic system is a system involving a small number of particles. For example, a pendulum, or balls hitting each other. Or if you want to move to a quantum mechanical system, things like a single molecule of water, or an electron orbiting a proton in a hydrogen atom. The important point is that we have very few particles in the system, and so we can write out equations of motion for each particle, solve and know everything about the system. However, even the slightest complication makes the system analytically unsolvable. Even two electrons going around a proton has no known solution, so approximation methods are used, such as perturbation theory. With this in mind, how then do we model the ridiculously large number of particles found in any real system? For example, 18 milliliters of water has 6 times 10 to the 23 water molecules, an impossible system to solve from its equations of motion. This is an example of a macroscopic system. And so, to know about larger systems, we need new quantities and new laws describing how these quantities interact. These form the basis of thermal and statistical physics. Next, another interesting concept is that of an equilibrium state, which is a macroscopic system whose properties are statistically independent of time as long as there are no external forces influencing the system. We will neglect the statistically for the video, but you can keep it in mind. From our daily lives, we experience systems going to their equilibrium states all the time. A flask of tea cooling down until it's the same temperature as the room it's in. A cold drink on a hot summer's day warming up. Both of these are systems going towards their equilibrium values. In these examples, the macroscopic system is the flask or as its environment is the room around it. The only thing that is transferred is heat, so long as you ignore the steam. In both of these cases, the examples are that of a closed system, a system where matter cannot leave, but heat, and hence energy, transfers between the system and its environments. So let's briefly describe what systems there can be. An open system is one where heat and matter can both transfer between the system and its environment. A closed system is one where only heat can transfer between the system and its environment. And finally, an isolated system where no heat and no matter transfer. Next, what do I mean by thermodynamical properties? These are things such as pressure, temperature, volume, electrical charge, applied magnetic field, all of which can be measured experimentally. The basic assumption of thermodynamics is that we can describe a macroscopic system by knowing these properties, but the number of properties is significantly less than the number of particles in the system. We then need to know how all of these new thermodynamical properties are related to each other, and this is called an equation of state which describes how a change in one affects all of the rest. The most famous of these is the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT, where P is pressure, V volume, N is the number of particles, T is the temperature, and K is the Boltzmann constant. So how does energy change in a gas? There are two ways which I wish to discuss, work done by a gas and heat absorbed by a gas. Now let's say you had a gas with pressure being applied to it on all sides. If the volume of the gas changes, then the gas has to move through that pressure. Hence there is an energy change in the gas, and this is an example of work. Now heat is a much more easy concept to understand. If something increases in temperature, heat has been added to the system. If you add heat to the system, the temperature rises. So now that we have both the concepts of work and heat, we can state the first law of thermodynamics. In an arbitrary thermodynamical transformation, that is when you change some of the thermodynamical properties of the system, then the change in energy of the system is actually the change in the heat absorbed by the system. Take the work done by the system. This law was established by James Joule, born in Salford, England in 1818. He did it by showing that heat and work are both forms of energy. He did it by heating up beer. It is interesting to note that if we had an isolated system, one where heat cannot enter or leave, then the change in heat of the system is just the work done by the system as the change in energy is equal to zero, so the change of one has to be in the change of the other. For a couple more examples, if all of the gas was trapped on one side of the room and then it went to fill the rest of the room, then no work has been done and moreover no heat has left the room, so the total change of energy in the room must be zero. This is an important example because it shows just because something has changed, the energy does not need to change. But say a gas pushes a piston, it has to do work as it has moved through pressure. And so the total energy of the system has to have gone down. Next, we want to aim for the second law of thermodynamics. To do this, we first need two observations. That while we can easily turn work into heat, taking heat and turning it all into work is impossible. This as well as seeing that hot things cool and cold things heat up, but never the other way around naturally we can define a new thermodynamic property, which is called entropy. Surprisingly, the path to the second law is done by examining engines. What an engine does is take heat away from something and cause work, burning petrol to turn a wheel, for example. Let us draw a very, very technical diagram of this engine. As you can see, the engine takes heat from the hot environment and separates it into work. But then again, have you ever seen an engine that didn't get hot itself? 
This is because the engine emits heat to its environment. That is, it isn't 100% efficient at changing heat into work. So the technical diagram should be this. We have gotten an experimental fact. We cannot make an engine that converts heat to work at 100% efficiency, even when the system is frictionless and no heat is transferred other than the work. The system still cannot be 100% efficient. If you want to know more, you should see the Otto cycle. So we have arrived at the Kelvin Planck statement of the second law of thermodynamics. It is impossible to construct an engine operating in a cycle, which produces no other effect than the extraction of heat from a reservoir and performs an equivalent amount of work. This formalization of the second law of thermodynamics can also be phrased in terms of cooling systems, which is called the Clausius statement. The two formulations are equivalent, and so we should not go into it here. Okay, we have the second law, but we haven't come across entropy yet. So clearly this should be our next goal. So consider a system at a temperature, let's say T. If we were then to add a small amount of heat, then the importance of the heat added is less if we have a very large temperature, because one degree compared to 10 million is hardly anything. But if the temperature was small, the heat added would be more important. So we want to weight the added heat by its importance. And so we do this by the change in heat divided by the temperature. This now has the properties discussed as a small temperature is a bigger fraction than a large temperature. If we then add up the relative weights about any cyclic change of the system, the sum will always be less than or equal to zero. This statement can be mathematically proved, that is, given the first and the second law, this statement is always true. Moreover, the first law and this statement imply the second law. That we have something that is equivalent to the second law tells us that this weight is actually very important. And so for a cycle that is reversible, the change in heat divided by the temperature is defined as the change in the entropy. Hence, we have an equivalent condition. In an isolated system, one in which heat cannot enter or leave, nor matter, the change in entropy is always greater than or equal to zero. That is, entropy in an isolated system can never decrease. And for a system and its surroundings, if thermodynamics always holds, then the entropy will never decrease. Please note the wording. Never decrease does not mean it will increase. It could stay the same. And so we could derive the following. An isolated system at equilibrium must be in the states of maximum entropy. And so we finally have the concepts of entropy. But it seems very abstract. What physically does the change in heat divided by the temperature mean? It is an entropy change. But as it is a thermodynamic property, what does it physically map out to? You may have heard before that entropy is the measure of disorder of a system. But this is just very loose and not accurate enough to correspond to the very technical definition we have so far. And so to see what entropy is, one has to examine the foundations of thermodynamics. That is, statistical physics. A macro system is still made of particles and the actual position, momentum, etc. of the particles is called the microstate corresponding to the macro system. Basically, the way the system actually is if you can look and see each one of the particles independently. But importantly, one macrostate may have many, many, many microstates that would correspond to it. For a quick example, we'll just think of three particles. And remember, normal systems consist of thousands upon thousands of particles. So three particles is relatively little. In our example, these particles can either take energy, one, or zero. And then we can take account of all possible states the system could ever be in. In the diagram, things on the bottom row have energy one, and things on the top row have energy zero. And so we can add up the total energy for each one of the possible states and find out how much energy the system overall will have. The important thing to notice is that when every single particle is in the same state, there is only one microstate for the corresponding macrostate, that is for the energy equals zero or for the energy equals three. To discuss this further, we need to make two postulates, that is, things that we assume are true. That every single microstate for a given macrostate is equally possible. If you look at the energy equals one, the state could easily be in any one of those three states, with a probability of a third each. Next, we have Boltzmann's postulate, that the log of the number of microstates is proportional to the entropy of the system, S equals K, natural log of omega, where omega is the number of states corresponding to the same macrostate. What this basically says is that the more microstates corresponding to the bigger macrostate, the more messy, the more disordered that particular state is, hence higher the entropy. Hence we finally have a physical interpretation for entropy. It is related to the number of microstates corresponding to a macrostate, the number of small things that make up the same big thing. From this, the third law of thermodynamics is understandable, that the entropy of a system tends to zero as the temperature also tends to zero, or equivalently, zero degrees Kelvin. An equal statement is that absolute zero is unattainable in a finite number of steps. As a quick summary, we have the three laws of thermodynamics. The change in internal energy is the heat added to the system take the work done by the system. The entropy of an isolated system never decreases. And finally, that the temperature of a system goes to zero as entropy also goes to zero.